Friday the 13th is a fantasy-based horror American series that first aired in 1987. The show is a fantasy horror American show in which the main characters hunt down cursed antique objects that their owners are recklessly using, increasing the numbers of deaths in humanity. The show follows Jack, Mickey and Ryan, the show's main characters, as well as notable guest appearances as they plot the process of neutralising cursed objects in the sacred vault in the Curious Goods Shop. Before we go into our video on the subject, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support support us by subscribing to our channel. It's a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you, now let's begin. Crafting the Haunting Legacy Larry B. Williams and Frank Mancuso Jr. brought the show to life. Frank is a common denominator in both Friday the 13th TV show and the film series too. The show, originally titled The 13th Hour, was renamed Friday the 13th Series so that audiences could relate to the popularity of the film series and expect the same level of excitement from the TV show. The show, which originated in Canada, ran for three seasons, featured 72 episodes, and if you can find it, the show is also known as Friday's Curse. Jason Voorhees the film's main character doesn't appear in the TV series, so no connection between the two is laid out. We enjoy the show's attention to detail. The opening credits scene is sure to get fans excited as the eerie music begins and we're taken on a stroll through the antique shop. The show begins by setting the audience in motion and narrating the story of the shop's owner, Louis Vendredi, and how in his pursuit of powers, wealth and immortality, he ended up making a deal with the devil. In exchange for his desires, the devil asked him to sell antique objects, but they appear to be cursed. Not only that, but to fulfill the possessor's desire for the cursed objects, he had to make a human sacrifice, which was the devil's cue. This results in heartbreaking deaths across the series, and each episode delves into the elements of a cursed object and its powers. Furthermore, the absolutely mind-boggling elements of the cursed object was that it gave the possessor temporary powers. To continue using them, the process had to be repeated, which was strengthened by the devil. The show's success is dependent on three key performers. The guest appearances were both substantial and memorable. Mickey Ryan and Jack provided coverage for the main characters. Jack was Lewis's longtime friend who had made a deal with the devil, but due to his temper tantrums and reluctance to serve as the devil's future puppet, he broke the agreement and ended up losing his soul to the devil in the first episode. It was fascinating to see the breaking of the deal scene, in which Lewis refuses to hand over a cursed doll to Sarah Polly to protect the little girl, demonstrating that he did eventually. Mickey and Ryan inherited the antique shop after Lewis's death simply because they were the closest relatives. Mickey and Ryan are married cousins but there's a hint of sexual tension between them, despite the complicated setting. It's worth noting, however, that Mickey and Ryan were able to sell the cursed doll on their own during the first season, and this was their only sale. The leads then go on a mission to find all of the cursed objects before they fall into the wrong hands and are used to harm people. All of the cursed objects are sold by Lewis were recorded in a manifest, which the leads use to track them down. With a plethora of these cursed objects and a constant fear of death, the leads keep the audiences engaged with their own fun elements as each object is discovered Discovered, taking them on an emotional and experiential roller coaster. To be completely rendered, the cursed objects must be secured in a vault specifically designed for them, in the antique shop curious goods section, as hunting them alone doesn't suffice. Rashid, a mystic, and Jack's friend who appeared in the season 1 finale and the second season premiere was supposed to be on board for a long time, but his role was cut short because he didn't fit in with the three main characters. Rashid was also very knowledgeable about the occult. He consistently outwitted Jack's brilliance. He is the one who helps the leads who are constantly confused by Lewis's reappearance as a ghost in the show, as seen in the episode Bottle of Dreams. Though Rashid appears only a few times in the show, his presence is permanent and serves as a guiding force. The character appears in a few episodes, including Vanity's Mirror and Voodoo Mambo. The show concludes with a lightning strike to the title, which disappears, creating its own unique perception. The program was originally scheduled to run for five seasons, but was shortened to three on a whim. According to reports, the cast was so unaware of this situation that filming was halted during the announcement and the episode aired as the season finale. There were also possibilities for a reunion of both the film and TV series in the finale, with the hockey mask remaining with Jason Voorhees, but this didn't come to fruition and only remained a rumour. X-Files and Warehouse 13 are two shows that drew inspiration from the Friday the 13th series and brought incredible storylines to the screen. The show was, however, heavily criticised when it first premiered for its gruesome violence, but it eventually blended in with the viewers' preferences. Exploring the episodes of Friday the 13th, the series. 
Now we all know Mickey and Ryan received their inheritance, but it's worth noting that Jake was the one who revealed to them the curse that accompanied this inheritance. This picturesque episode also provides insight into the life of Mickey's fiance, Lloyd. Ryan and Jake met at the shop for the first time. Upon their chance meeting, the audience gains a clear picture of the two co-owners' future action plans for the antique shop. While Ryan is clearly excited to move forward with the shop, Mickey is perceived as snobby and wants to get rid of it as soon as possible. We can't blame her, given that she ended up locked in a vault where cursed objects become inert and there's a creepy doll. Of course, the shop was eventually sold off in the future. Subsequently, they come across Lewis's manifest, which contains a list of all the cursed objects, and Mickey and Ryan discover that they sold one of the listed objects. They embark on an adventure to locate the cursed doll, which is now in the possession of a spoiled girl, Sarah Polly, in order to absolve their guilt and, of course, to satisfy the underlying excitement about the small quest. However, this little girl is fully aware of the doll's abilities. The doll usually did things in the absence of people but not always. The show's twist occurs when, in an attempt to kill Sarah's stepmother, the stepmother is killed in the following scene. The ending could have been a bit better, it felt like a typical doll story. In the second episode of the TV series, The Poison Pen by Durnford King, we see the three main characters skim through a news story. They discover that the next object they need to find is a quill pen. The downside is that writing about it kills people. Ryan, Mickey and Jack prepare to track down the quill pen, which is currently hidden in a secluded monastery, albeit a well-known one. The monastery was well known for its oracle of death. The condition for entering the monastery was that only monks could enter. The monastery also had a resident monk whose prophecies are quite fatal. Jack is the first to enter after locating it and he devises a plan for Mickey and Ryan to see it and find the owner. Mickey is transformed into a man so that she can enter the monastery too. Despite her feminine voice, she is readily accepted as a man, raising suspicions about the scriptwriter's prejudices against the protagonist. It's a good episode with a great cursed object concept and an okayish conclusion. Conclusion. Cupid's Quiver is the third episode in which the trio searches for a statue called the Cupid of Malak, which is located in a nearby college. The statue's unique feature is its ability to elicit feelings of love. The statue shoots an arrow at the possessor's desired person. The arrow is not a tangible arrow, rather it's invisible and resembles a light beam. However, some stranger named Eddie Monroe, played by Dennis Forrest, happened upon it and had an unrequited love up until that point. His appearance is much older than that of a college student, but he performed admirably. He isn't particularly liked by anyone, but no one is aware of his behaviour patterns or the fact that he's a stalker. He had been stalking a lady for some time now. The only thing that could have been improved was the ending of this episode. It could have been a lot better, but it's still a good episode overall. In the Spirit of Television episode, the cursed object is a TV set that summons the spirits of the dead, kills their enemies, and improves the TV owner's life. After receiving the information, the trio begins investigating a chronically ill psychic named Zant, who had celebrity clients who were tragically killed in accidents, including a television set. Initially, we see a rock star visiting the medium, haunted by the guilt of her bandmate's death from an overdose. It's revealed that the dead girl blamed the rock star and ultimately killed her. However, the villain here is quite active, as the initiating person person can only see the dead spirit. Jack feels that something is quite off on the whole. A similar thing happens with a fashion designer, where everything starts out friendly but then the spirit becomes dangerous and evil. Jack brings along a friend who is an expert in all of this, but he's no help, concluding that Zant is fine. The episode concludes with Ilsa and her henchmen being dragged to the spirit via the television itself. Overall, this is a great episode, primarily because we get to see a lot of Jack in action. The second to last episode of the Friday the 13th TV series, Tree of Life, directed by William Fruitt and written by Christine Foster, features a druidic fertility idol as a cursed object. This object's superpower was the ability to provide the owner with fraternal twins of the opposite gender in exchange for the father's life. Dr. Oakwood's episode features an all-female cult. The fertility clinic keeps the girls. A woman claims that they have kept her daughter as their own for a long time. It was rumoured that a second sacrifice of a male person would be beneficial to the cult. Dr. Oakwood is tragically killed at the end of the episode. Johnny, the new character provides much of the evidence for this episode, such as finding the kids in the clinic's attic, seeing a ring of druidic stones, and hearing screams in the night to solidify Jack and Mickey's doubts. This episode was missing links, loopholes, and fun facts like Ryan Dalian. The Charnel Pit, season 3 finale, shot on a whim and declared to be the final episode of the series overall, aired on May 26th, 1990. Written by Jim Henshaw and directed by Armand Mastriani, it focuses on the cursed object known as the double-sided painting. The 
The painting was actually a time portal that would activate whenever it was touched by blood. It brings forward the exchange of people from two different timelines. The painting's 20th century side represented life, while the 18th century side represented the past and the sinister world of Desaad. It was Jack and Johnny who figured out why the unidentified woman floating in the river was linked to the double-sided painting. A person who is still alive is transported back in time and a past person is then brought to the present. This episode contains a few erotic scenes, but they're all television friendly and not shady in the slightest. The professor and Assad's contrasting personalities, as well as their aging and laziness, are prominent themes in the episode. The episode concludes with the three leads outside the vault, its door closed and the audience inside the vault, demonstrating that we too are trapped inside. Delving into the cast and characters. Jack Marshak. Chris Wiggins took on the role of Jack in Friday the 13th TV series. He is a jack of all trades who continues to amuse the audiences with his various characteristics in the new episodes. In Cupid's Quiver, his bartending skills were particularly impressive. He's a magician who also practices occultism. He always makes an effort to help the crew, whether it's picking locks or forging documents. With his constant assistance and talents, he's indomitable and not easily replaced. Mickey and Ryan's attempts to go on quests without him are futile as Jack holds the key to everything. Jack's life was quite lonely as his close ones all disappeared from him or died in several instances. His beloved son was lost in a nightmare about a young girl in the dream plane itself. The girl he becomes engaged to, the scientist abandons him for research work in Kenya only to return a few years later, recognizing her love for Jack and wishing to re-engage with him. But fate does not favor the two as she dies in the brain drain episode. Jack's only source of support and creative outlet was his work, as well as the new quest he had embarked on with the two cousins to retrieve the soul to antique objects, which brought him both joy and contentment. Mickey Foster. Louise Roby does an excellent job playing the girl with the 80s hair and clothes. Originally known as Michelle, the inheritor of the antique object store is discovered co-owning the store with her cousin from marriage, Ryan Dalian. Mickey frequently babysits her nephew, JB. She's regarded as a daring character because she ended her engagement to her fiance in pursuit of antique objects. However, one should consider that the decision was simple because Mickey never truly shared love with Lloyd. Mickey's character evolves over time from a shallow person obsessed with herself, her clothes and her demeanour to one with depth, a strong will, and to be honest, a hint of darkness. The episode of Tales I Live, Heads You Die, in which Mickey is killed by a cursed coin but is fortunately revived, thanks to the brains of Jack and Ryan who successfully manipulate the antagonist to bring her back to life. Ryan Dalian. Ryan, the co-owner of the antique shop played by John DeLamay, is quite the character. With the weight of failed ambition on his shoulders, we witness Ryan's vulnerability at the start of the show. He wears his heart on his sleeve as he falls hard for our beautiful 80s Mickey, who, given the current complicated situation, strongly rejects him. A few times at the start of the show, we see Ryan and Mickey disagree about the future operations of the antique store. Ryan succumbs to Mickey's influence and sells the store despite his enthusiasm for renovating it. However, it's clear that they both regret the decision. They have a soft spot for each other, which is obvious and visible. It's also clear that after Mickey died, Ryan was unable to suppress his feelings for her. It's unfortunate but necessary for the plot that at the start of the final season of the show, Ryan is transformed into a small child in an episode of The Prophecies, and thus his role ends. Johnny Ventura. This role is played by Steve Monarch and appears at the end of the second season. He replaces Ryan in the main trio. His stride is casual and his approach is perceived as careless and hippie as he approaches Mickey from a shallow position. His interest develops into love over time as he goes through life's challenges with Mickey by his side. His personality is reckless, proud, boastful and lacking in accountability. We see several of his bad falls in the third season all while he hopes to be rescued by one of his contacts. He strolls through jail casually having been arrested several times on several occasions. Louis Vendredi. Louis is the person who sets the entire plot for the TV series in motion. R.G. Armstrong plays the epic but short-lived character. He had struck a deal with the devil to gain immortality by selling him his soul. It's amazing to know that as we learn later in the Pipe Dream episode about his ability to heal people's wounds, he becomes quite conscientious after refusing to sell the cursed doll to Sarah, a young girl. However, that was the only scene in which we saw Louis's soft side, which is sad. He is a pure evil character and the story's main villain overall. Contrary to the alleged facts, he was also stated to be the leader of the Witch's Coven when he was alive. Channel their entities that we may know. Life everlasting. He was my friend, he wouldn't be- To watch or not to watch. 
deciding the appeal of Friday the 13th, the series. In terms of popularity, the show was well known due to the film series Friday the 13th, which came before it. The show is not your typical show with repetitive killing sprees or horror scares. Instead, each episode features more unique elements and antiques sold from the store. It was quite graphic, horror themed, and a good start to science fiction enthusiasts. There are elements of suspense and evilness, and the plots are very well curated and developed. The audience knows they're in for a ride when the opening credits play Play chilling music and show the antique store's interior. There's more of an emphasis on Ryan and Jack than the other characters. Ryan left the show early, but in the second season finale, the audience can see that he was still the main character. He hasn't been forgotten and is very much missed. The relationships between the three leads is quite enjoyable throughout the entire seasons. Their brotherhood, their friendship, their flirting and playful banter all contribute to the audience's emotional connection with this trio. Jack's role as a father to both cousins received a lot of praise at the time. Regardless of the cousins' tantrums or spontaneous actions, Jack could always be relied on as his nature contrasted with that of Lewis's, the cousins' actual ancestor. The show had a niche audience and was once ranked second in syndicated ratings. The episode had excellent plots, but the endings could always have been improved, as we saw in instances where the characters were dissatisfied satisfied with their own actions. The show remained realistic by not allowing the protagonist to win every episode by successfully recovering the said antique object. This allowed the characters to explore themselves, their minds and their motivations while also strengthening their connection with the audience. The show is a must-see for horror fans thanks to its excellent theme song, cinematography, camaraderie, suspense, plot and of course the horror. The show aired at midnight and made for a good binge watch at the time. Marvelous Verdict This show has a wide reach and the suspense and horror factors are quite high, no doubt about that. Because it was quite a low budget show, the graphics and visuals could have been better, but since it was from the 1980s and 90s, we can't really expect much by comparison to, say, current shows. There's excitement and good build-up in each episode, and the audience is kept interested in the identification of the cursed objects, as well as the outcome of the lead's quest to find said object and lock it away in the vault. There's a plethora of cursed objects marked in the manifest, and the script writers have very well played along with the theme, giving the audience a more thrilling experience each and every night. The show remains realistic in its approach with themes such as love, friendship, bonding, brotherhood, selfishness, evil, death, the devil, and so on. It has absorbed and personified the idea of yin and yang. By depicting extreme polarities in the same setting, among the same groups, the show is an enjoyable watch and should be played the next time you want to binge a horror classic TV series. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't done so already. Otherwise, have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.